Tonight's Meridian Focus is different because tonight we see a TV reporter turn the camera on himself to record an intensely personal story in the face of death. Sean Holden has been a friend and colleague here at Meridian for more than three years. Before that, he was political correspondent for TVAM. Last year, all of us here at Meridian were shocked when Sean was stricken with a killer disease, leukemia, blood cancer. It attacks 2,000 people a year. It kills 800. Sean's reaction to the appalling news, he continued to work from his hospital bed. And this is his video diary of a harsh battle for life. It's spring 1995, about the end of March, and I've just been diagnosed as suffering from acute myeloid leukemia, which is cancer of the blood. And I'm going to tell the story of what happens to me over the next few months. What kind of story that's going to be, I don't know yet. Um, it's going to make a difference, obviously, in my life and in my appearance. My first feeling was, um, I'm going to be with you and, and I'll support you throughout this, whatever happens. And I'll, I'll always be there for you. Um, and so um, it was immediate support. And my first question was, well, well what are the chances of, of being cured? And Sean said, yes, it, it can be cured. Um, and from there, um, a long explanation followed from the doctors. And they told me that his chance of survival was 60%. And they followed that by saying, you have to be as positive as possible. We've been together for four years. It was a very tumultuous affair. We travelled a lot and we lived together and we had a lot of fun. And we finally decided to get married. Then, two months later, we got the awful news. And one way Sean decided to deal with it was to report the story. So the message from NATO to the new regime in the Kremlin is like... Sean is an extremely versatile reporter. He is very serious and intense and intelligent when when the need occurs when he's doing political reporting on the other hand he has a very youthful colorful imaginative way of looking outside at, at, at life and um we'll be talking to um i don't know children's toys and hanging upside down pretending to be a bat is a bat that nobody expected to see tonight here the south hampshire cod bat so occasionally my thoughts do turn to that and dying and is it my time? Of course, everybody tells me it's not my time. And you have to fight. But I've done quite a lot in my life, and so sometimes I wonder, well, do I actually feel that I have everything to live for, or can I say, well, if I went now, you know, I've done quite a bit. One of Sean's first thoughts after he was diagnosed is, perhaps we should get married now, just in case I do die and also before he lost his hair. Um, and we did consider it, consider this, and definitely I would have gone ahead with it, but after consideration, um, we both agreed this was too pessimistic. We were determined he was going to live, and that was the only way we were going to deal with it. One of the things I have to do is to visit a sperm bank in London. Um, this is the third time I've been. The reason being that this treatment is, is possibly going to make me temporarily or even permanently sterile. I've never had any idea of what such a place was like before, so it's been quite a bizarre experience. Um, but I'm off now uh, for the last time because the treatment is about to begin, probably tomorrow. Scary time. It's um, kind of a bizarre sort of place for it to come to, but uh, quite necessary. But I don't think it's necessary for you to come any further than that. <laughs> One of the things I've had to do with, was thinking about chemotherapy because every, I, I think I've described it as scary and everybody knows it's not very nice. And, um, but you have to get into my head that uh, it's the cure, it's not the enemy. Today is the big day. Treatment begins. How do I feel about it? I feel quite neutral about it. Um, as I've said, I've changed my attitude, so it's another cure. Um, I've actually got used to taking so many drugs, and they've started to inject uh, antibiotics through the lines I have, which I'll show you. This 
It was called a Hickman line, and I once fallen down. But, um, it goes straight into a major vein in, near the heart. This one is for drugs, and this one will be for blood products. And this is saving me from having many, many injections. Excuse me if that's a bit um, gruesome for you. This is the end of the first day of chemotherapy, which has been a day of having, it seems to me, gallons of stuff injected into me, and still taking my ordinary pills and so on and so forth, and an apprehension, no doubt about that. But at the end of it, I, I haven't felt too bad, I have to say. I've felt maybe faintly sick, but I'm not sure if that's not my own apprehension. And, um, and a bit tired, but beyond that, nothing. And I've also got some new pyjamas, because the nurses are fed up with me loafing around in, in the uh, hospital gown, so Corinna went out and got me some new pyjamas. Well, chemotherapy didn't turn out to be quite such a breeze. I was sick this morning. Um, Woke up feeling a bit queasy, had breakfast, and then did it all in the sink. Um, I think I feel slightly uh, ill again. But uh, that's part of the problem. And, and the, the drug makers of the chitrol drug, which is supposed to stop you from being sick, are so proud of it. They say they give their money back to the NHS every time somebody's sick. So at least I've made a saving on the public purse. The tree outside my room. It's got bare branches yet. But I'll still be here, I think, when leaves on those branches have obscured the sky. What a boring prospect. The tedium was terrible because he couldn't leave the room for a month after each chemotherapy because of the risk of infection. It temporarily destroys the immune system. So everything had to come to his room, even the hairdresser. This is Carol from Snips in Frimley. Mr. Snips. Mr. Snips. <laughs> he decided to preempt the uh, effect of chemotherapy by uh, having a Eric Cantona type haircut. He did it because he didn't want to see his hair falling out on his pillow every time he woke up in the morning. Um, and it was really the most positive thing he could have done. It seems quite important to me to make the decision yourself of, of getting rid of your hair rather than uh, it falling out in chunks and um, so when the odd few strands started to come out in the shower I asked Carol if she would come up and, and do this. Uh, it's just a part of taking control of your illness as much as possible I think. What do you think then, eh? Sean's doctor, Dr. Van der Peck, came one day and told him wonderful news that his sister Sarah was a perfect match for a bone marrow transplant. A bone marrow transplant more than doubles the rate of cure for leukemia. Of his two brothers and his two sisters, she was the only one who matched. I think that had none of us been a match, and I understand that there are lots of cases where even with a few brothers and sisters who still don't get a match, then we just would have kept looking till we found one, but it's nice to know that we don't have to look very far. It was a perfect match, but in a quite unusual way, they said it couldn't have been a more perfect match if they'd been twins. So it was excellent, um, and that was an immense relief, and actually, yes, that was definitely a, a flag of hope for Sean on the horizon throughout all his illness. Today has been a hot, dry swine of a day. I really, really feel bad. Um, temperature's got up to 39, we've sick twice. Um, you know, so it's a bit of a roller coaster, this, but the, the point is it makes you realise how hard the positive thinking is to maintain when it gets to days like this.
Oh, this has become a real grind. It's eating food that I don't want to eat, that I can't taste. When I feel sick, <coughs> um, my whole digestive system is up the creek, but I don't do myself any good by not eating, so I just make myself put it down. Here we see part of the indignity of medical treatment. This has been put down my nose and goes all the way into my stomach so that I can be fed uh, food because I just cannot eat enough and I'm slowly starving. Although I've had quite a good day today, I'm very weak because basically I've eaten very little for two, two weeks. first uh, day out for some weeks, so um, it's like getting out of prison, um, rather strange, good to see, good to have more liberty, not to be confined to one room. So what's Sean getting iller and iller? Um, all, all I knew is that I had to remain as positive and supportive as possible. But of course, there were times when you know somebody so well, and I can see lead in his heart. And, um, and um, well, I think we'd share the, the sadness and, and, um, and just hold on to each other. I haven't talked about it in hospital, but I've just been through two, well, one hell of a hell hole, really. I had two days of utter despair where all the negative thoughts piled in and I couldn't, couldn't fight them back. And, um, you know, it's, um, terrible thing when you wake up in the night and all you think about is your own death. Um, you know the statistics, you know the logic of it, but I wasn't even feeling ill, so I was just hit by this typhoon of depression. So to get out, back to the family home, is a relief beyond measure to get out of that hospital. Um, but I was already coming up out of it anyway, I think, knowing that I was coming away. But everybody goes through this, apparently. And I talk to the Macmillan nurse. You talk percentages, you talk about luck, you talk about fate. Um, and, and you know, you talk common sense, right? The prognosis is good. Uh, most people get cured. And at the end of it, you think that some people die. When I saw Sean really scared and worried, um, it would get to me, and I'd sort of leave the room and, and maybe go and cry in the, in the loo for about five minutes and come back and, and be sort of as cheerful as possible. I remember him singing like a bird in, in his caged room, and that, that was very sad because he was being so brave and trying to be so happy in such desperate circumstances. It's a number of days I, I, I've had out of hospital now, but uh, I went back today for my marrow test. And um, the news is unbelievable, really. The leukemia cells have gone. Um, I've got back to a position. I still have a marrow problem, but they're talking about um, one more set of, uh, of chemotherapy uh, and then into an early bone marrow transplant. He was very happy because all the leukemia cells had been destroyed. Um, and little did we know what was around the next corner. Um, right at the beginning of the second chemotherapy, he was um, you know, excreting blood to the, to the um, point of two litres a day. And you've only got eight liters of blood in your in your body, 
um, it was terrifying, very, very scary. And apparently the nurses asked him at 3 a.m. in the morning, do you want to call home? I.e., um, you know, these are almost like your last hours. I was awake all night and doctors and nurses crawling all over me. I've collected some extra bits and pieces, as you can see here, um, as a consequence. Um, basically, I was passing blood every time I went to the toilet. and. Uh, and so I was having to be transfused and making sure that my blood levels were all above what I was losing and so on. And it was a rather dreadful night. The doctors promised me it would calm down in the morning, and it did. I looked for um, a yoga teacher to come in to um, help Sean relax. And during my search for a yoga teacher, I came across a different variety of, of um, faith healers and I asked one to come and visit Sean and he did and he laid his palms on, on Sean. As far as we can see it had no effect certainly at the time but one never knows. Um, maybe he did and I also sent Sean's photograph off to another faith healer um, and the yoga he teacher finally did come and was helpful and occasionally I joined in actually in his yoga lessons and, and we listened to his Zen umming. <laughs> The new development is that I've had problems uh, with eating and uh, I'm just getting back into it and the consequence of these problems where I've been sick almost just at the thought of food and you lose your appetite anyway because of the chemotherapy and you lose your taste and your saliva doesn't work properly and so on so you've got no interest in food. Um, so. In my case, it became so difficult that they put me on this. And this white bag contains everything that you need for food. And it's tripped into me for 24 hours a day. Today is good news. I'm discharged from hospital after only two bouts of chemotherapy and um, waiting to uh, go forward for my bone marrow transplant. He cried when he came home. Uh, he was so happy in one way and, and realised how dangerous it had all been. So it was all the tension of the past weeks coming in on top of him and, and the relief of being there at long last. And coming home is quite difficult in a way. I mean, you reflect on all that it means to you that you've missed, you know, for such a long time. I found it quite emotional just to see my things, my ordinary things, you know, even like my candlesticks. It was quite, well, it was tearful coming back. I took time off work and I used to drive him around. And actually, we had some of our happiest days. Um, in between his treatment and um, just day trips, for example, to Brighton. Um, and that was excellent. This is University College Hospital, and this is where the bone marrow transplant is going to be done. So this is going to be my home for the next four or five weeks, and the operation, such as it is, will be taking place here. This is my chemotherapy in UCH, in my room. And this is where I'm going to have to be for five weeks. I feel quite relaxed about it, and um, I feel I'm on the final course of a difficult trek. This extraordinary thing, well, it's the most fantastic thing I've come across so far. It's changing my blood group from O positive to A positive, because Sarah, my sister's blood, is A positive, so I have to match her. So from now on, I'm going to be A positive. And the blood comes out of my arm. This is around the machine. Comes back into my chest, and, and that's the first stage of becoming a different blood group. Fantastic. Well, they harvested my bone marrow this morning. Um, it was more difficult than they thought, so they took it from various different sites, and it's truly painful now. But. Uh, but hopefully this means it's the beginning of, of the end of Sean's illness and the start of, of his cure. So that makes it worthwhile. 
Sarah was fantastic, a real lifesaver, and she didn't complain at all at the pain that the needles breaking into her breast and her hip bones caused, even though she was sick with pain afterwards. All bone marrow donors are fantastic. And for Sean, it was much easier. He simply watched the bone marrow drip into him like so many blood transfusions before. You see this stuff here? This is diamorphine. It's just about heroin that's being put into me as a painkiller. Because I had a real problem with my throat as we moved into the um, no white cells phase after the chemotherapy that I had to cover my bone marrow transplant. So I'm in great pain all through my mouth. I can't eat or drink, so they have to find the strongest thing to counteract that. And this um, brother of heroin seems to be the man to do the job. Not strange. Basically, I'm, I've been high for a, a day. At times I felt quite lonely because he was so out of it and so far away and, and so not himself. <coughs> Although I saw how much pain and how dreadful it was what he was suffering, I did know that he was going to come through this and he'd be himself again. So it probably wasn't as terrible as it looks. I've heard the best news from the doctors this morning. They just came in and told me that uh, the, um, the graft is taken, which is signified by a, a certain reaction, which is, which is healthy. So. Um, so far, a success. It's been back at home, and um, it's nice. I go home for an evening or something and don't do very much necessarily, but it's nice, better to do it there than here. But the doctors keep saying, oh, you should be out by so and so and so and so, and I'm not, and you know, the days keep getting put back. It gets a bit demoralizing, really. But, um, this last haul is very tedious. Now is the hour. It's time to go. I'm, I'm leaving hospital. It's, um, but you don't jump up and down, and it's kind of um, depressing in a way because I've got to take bags full of pills and things like that with me. Leaving the hospital, he was very slow to move out and very unsure of himself and really depressed. Um, the main reason for that is because the doctors never said, this is it, you're free now, you're, you're completely cured. I think that Sean has made a remarkable recovery of returning to how he was before. I mean, I don't imagine anybody could do it quite so quickly. I mean, not even two months after having come out of hospital, He's back at work full time. Religion is a great creator of ritual and of symbolism, like, say, the monarchy or the House of Lords. I certainly found there was no consolation in looking towards religion. I put all my trust in the medical treatment he was receiving, and so did Sean. But who knows? Other people were praying for us throughout. All our friends, I know, were um, kindly lighting candles for Sean and mass was being said for him. I think um, anybody going through this sort of thing needs a kindred spirit and needs somebody <laughs> who can relate to them and, and feel with them the, the, the suffering. And um, I was extremely grateful to be the one he was turning to. And, um, and forever we will have that memory together of how we fought through these difficult times. As the father had loved me. One year, one month, and one week after Sean went into hospital, we were married. It's spring 2020, about the end of March. It's now 25 years since I was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Exactly, today on the 27th of March. But it's not only the 25 extra years that I've gained, 
uh, we have, thanks to the NHS, got many more extra years because of the four children that Corinna and I have had in those intervening years. The first one is Jude, who's now studying theoretical physics at the University of Edinburgh, age 20, and Jake, age 19, who's now doing history at the University of East Anglia, and there's Freya, about to go and do a degree in English, and she's 18, and Finn, who is 16, and doing his A-levels. If you add them all together, plus the months, it adds up to exactly 100 years of extra life, an entire century, thanks to the NHS, <coughs> since I was diagnosed on that dark day in 1995. But the treatment of leukemia has still not improved the survival rates for acute myeloid leukemia in all that time, still less than 30%. So the research goes on, and I would ask you now to put in some money into leukemia research, which calls itself Bloodwise, to carry on that war against that terrible disease. Thank you.